when you're going through difficulty, when you're hurting, that's the most difficult time to not say something that you shouldn't be saying. And Jesus told his disciples, I will not talk with you much more. <laughs> For the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of the world is coming and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that belongs to him and he has no power over me. So it seems to me that Jesus is saying to his disciples, now look, I'm coming into a, a difficult time, gonna be under a lot of pressure, gonna be going through a lot. And right now, Satan has no part in me. He has no power over me. And I'm gonna need to be quieter now because I don't wanna give him any power over me or open any door for him to get into and wreak havoc in my life. Isaiah 53, seven, I often wondered what this meant and now I know. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he was submissive and he opened not his mouth. <laughs> Come on, let's read it again. When he was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he was submissive and he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. You know the old saying, if you can't say something positive, just don't say anything at all. Well, we could all use a little bit of that. During the six agonizing hours that Jesus was on the cross, he only spoke seven times. Seven times in six hours. And it totaled 41 words in Greek and 58 if it's translated into English. It took approximately one minute for him to make these seven statements. So that means that for the other five hours and 59 minutes he was on the cross, he was totally silent. <laughs> I tell you what, I think I would have had a lot more to say than seven things. <laughs> Amen? Do you find it difficult when you're accused to just stand there and not try to defend yourself? Boy, I do. I'm still working with God on that one. We want to defend ourselves. We want to convince people that we're good, that we're not what they think we are, that they've got it all wrong about us. But you see, Jesus didn't care about his reputation. He let God take care of that. Amen. Come on, some of you are in a mess like that right now. You're being accused of things you didn't do. Your reputation's on the line. Some people are thinking bad things about you and what they're thinking is not even true. You don't have to get into trying to defend yourself. You don't have to try to convince them that you're good and that you didn't do what they think you did. Just keep quiet, serve God, and let God take care of your reputation. Amen? Can we respond to accusation the way Jesus did? Very often, he didn't answer his accusers at all. They must have thought he was one unique guy. <laughs> Luke 23, 9 and 10. So Herod asked him many questions, and he made no reply. You know, sometimes the things that people say are so stupid, they don't even warrant an answer. <laughs> really. And I, I mean, I realize in a certain situation with a certain person that I deal with, I kind of get into that bantering back and forth and it just gets really stupid, you know? And I thought recently, why am I even bothering to answer? That does not even dignify me making the effort to answer you. And I think sometimes if we would keep quiet, God could bring conviction. Did you hear me? If we would keep quiet, God could bring conviction. Don't argue with people about your relationship with God, trying to convince them to believe. You can't make somebody love Jesus. You can tell them, be a good example, and just zip your lip. You can't win everybody with words. A lot of people, you gotta win just by being a good example in front of them for a long time. Come on, for a long, long time. 
The Bible teaches us that we need to be long-suffering. Well, it's not long-suffering, it's long. <laughs> suffering. Meanwhile, the chief priests and the scribes stood by, continuing vehemently and violently to accuse him. And Jesus just stood there and said nothing. Mark 14, 60 and 61, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you not even one answer to make about what these men are testifying against you? But he kept still and he did not answer at all. You know, we would be wise to follow the advice of James that we read this morning in James 1, 19. Understand this, my beloved brethren, be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and to get angry. How many of you say a little bit more than you should say on quite a few occasions in your life? That's almost everybody. Dave didn't raise his hand, but. You need to get yours up there too, Charlie. Sometimes you. Ha uh ha. -huh. Being able to control what we say is a sign of spiritual maturity. And it's probably one of the number one signs of spiritual maturity. To go through a difficult time and not complain. <laughs> See, that hurt just hearing it, didn't it? I love it when people do this. You're like, oh. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> just to get through anything that's challenging and not complain. I know a few people that have got it mastered. I'm still on my way because I'm very verbal. My greatest gift is in my mouth, but it has also been one of my greatest problems. So if you don't need this tonight, I'll just preach to myself because I'm enjoying it quite a bit. First Corinthians chapter three and verse one. This is a very interesting thing that Paul said. However, brethren, I could not talk to you as to spiritual men, but as to non-spiritual men, men of the flesh in whom the carnal nature predominates. I had to talk to you as mere infants in the new life in Christ, unable to talk yet. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, they could talk, but he's saying, I can locate your level of spirituality and I know from listening to you that I can't really feed you the meat of the word yet because you're still unspiritual. And then he goes on to talk about how they're arguing with each other and having strife with each other and all these different things that we let go on. Now, after we talk here just a few more minutes about everything that Paul had to say about the mouth, we're gonna spend a good part of time tonight talking about what true wisdom is and you'll find that the, the first facet of true godly wisdom is to be peaceful. To be peace-loving and to be peaceful. And that's impossible if we don't learn some measure of control over our words. How many of you have had a fair amount of teaching about the power of your words? Okay. How many of you, this is kind of new, you're just like, I haven't really heard that much of this. Let's see if that's the case. You haven't really heard that much of this. So there's quite a few people that are just like, yeah, see us. Come on, don't be like down here. I, I can't see in, down in your lap. I want to, you know. Well, I want, you to, I want you to know something. You need to listen with both of the ears on your head and both of the ears in your spirit because this is a very important word of God for your life. Some of you can turn things around in your marriage if you'll change the things that you say. Some of you can change things with your relationship with your children if you'll change things that you say. Some of you can be promoted on your job if you'll change the way you talk. Don't sit at the lunch table and complain and murmur about with everybody else about the place where you work. Thank God you've got a job, and if you're not happy with it, 
somebody else who doesn't have one will probably take it. That doesn't mean maybe you're being treated great. That doesn't mean that you might not need a better job or you might not want to get another job. But while you're at the one where you're at, behave. <laughs> Amen? Out of the same mouth come forth blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be so. Let's show some spiritual maturity by saying right things. You can learn so much about yourself, and I can learn so much about myself. You know, sometimes if, if I hear myself saying something about somebody else that I think I'm, I love, I have to ask myself, what's in there? What's in me that brought that out? Because the Word of God says that it's what's in our heart that comes out of our mouths. Words are so, so, so powerful. There's so many more things that I could share with you, but I want to go on to James chapter 3, verse 13, and I want to talk to you about the true fruit of wisdom. Because a wise man or a wise woman will also be very careful about what they say. Let me just, let me just take a little quick survey and ask a question. How many of you... We'll just pick on the ladies for a minute. How many of you think that you could change the atmosphere in your home by changing some of the things you say? Uh-oh, wow. Look at that. Well, we're gonna get a lot of good fruit out of this message. How many of you men think you could change the atmosphere? No, wait a minute. How many of you men think that you could have a much happier wife if you talked to her a little differently. <laughs> Dave? <laughs> Do not sit there like a block of wood. You and Mike are both just sitting there like. No, I have to say, my husband is so positive. And every once in a while, when I want to be negative and he won't be negative with me, it's annoying. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if I'm in a mood to have a fit and he's just going to tell me everything's going to be wonderful, I'm just like, well, you know what I mean. You can change things just by how you talk. Well, bless God. <laughs> Why does everything have to be my responsibility? Well, let me, let me just say this. Whoever does the right thing first is the most powerful person. Whoever does the right thing first is the most powerful person. Now, wisdom is to be sought after. And I don't have time to get into Proverbs, but boy, Proverbs is so powerful about wisdom. It's really the beginning of a blessed life. And if, if you define wisdom, I've heard it. said that it's the proper use of knowledge, which that's very true because it doesn't do us any good to know anything if we don't use it properly. Sometimes people have got so much knowledge that it actually steals their faith and causes all kinds of problems in relationships. But I have my own little definition of wisdom, and I think it's fairly accurate, and so I'll just give you what I think wisdom is. I think wisdom is to do now what you'll be happy with later in life. I think wisdom thinks things through because if you read Proverbs, wisdom involves prudence, which is good management. It involves discernment, which means that we look 
beyond just the surface of things into the deeper meaning of maybe what's going on. You see, a person who has no wisdom will do what we said this morning we shouldn't do. They'll see somebody that's not like them or maybe looks what they would think is a little odd and they size them up as being a goofball, but somebody who has got some wisdom will see beyond that and actually take the time to find out the heart of the person. And so wisdom, wow, it's just, it's just a great, great, great thing to study. But now if we look at James chapter three, beginning in verse 13, it says that, who is there among you who is wise and intelligent? Then let him by his noble living show forth his good works with the unobtrusive humility, which is the proper attribute of true wisdom. So first of all, a proud person, a person who is haughty and walks in pride and is full of himself and thinks he's better than other people and smarter than other people, does not have one drop of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you. If you have jealousy and envy and contention, which is strife, and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not pride yourselves on it and thus be in defiance of and false to the truth. That is not wisdom either. It's foolish to be jealous of what somebody else has because that's never gonna get you what they have. The only way we're ever gonna get anything is to ask God for it and let him give it to us in his own way and in his own time. It's foolish for us to compare ourselves to other people because God is never gonna help us be somebody else. He's only gonna help you be you. You shouldn't even compare your prayer life to somebody else's prayer life. It would be totally useless for you to ask me how long I pray every day because even if I knew, which I don't, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> you know why? Because I don't want anybody comparing themselves to anybody else when it comes to your relationship with God. You are a unique individual and God wants to have a unique and an intimate and a personal relationship with you. And this is one of the things that it means when the Bible says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are free to be unique. The world may think you're weird, but God just wants you to be unique. But the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, undefiled, peace-loving. Let me ask you a question, do you love peace? Okay, can I tell you something? You're never gonna have it if you don't have it on purpose. I said you're never gonna have it if you don't have it on purpose. You gotta pursue it, you gotta seek it, and you go, gotta go after it, and you gotta make whatever changes you need to make in your life and in your behavior in order to have peace because peace is one of the most valuable, most powerful things that we can have. Peace is connected to God's anointing and it's connected to his blessings in our life. Peace. I tell you, I lived in the war zone all my life. And I finally got to the point, especially I would watch Dave and see how peaceful he was. And I just thought, maybe I could have that too. I grew up in turmoil. And I stayed full of turmoil for many, many, many years. It didn't take much at all to upset me, to offend me, to get me off in a wrong direction. And when I got to the point where I wanted peace so bad that I was willing to change whatever I had to change in my life in order to have it. I started having peace. Do you know that I found out that to fight with somebody to try to prove that I'm right is not worth the little fleshly zing I get out of it just to say, I was right. See, I was right. 
You know, being right is highly overrated. And it costs you a lot more than it's worth when you get it. We need to do a little more of what Jesus did. Just keep quiet, and if somebody wants to think they're right, let them think they're right. And if you need to be proven to be right, let's let God do the proving instead of trying to do it ourselves. <laughs> Especially over petty stuff that doesn't even make any sense at all. Come on, I know some of the arguments you have because Dave and I used to have them. We don't mess with it anymore, but you get old enough, you finally realize that you don't have any more days to waste being mad over something stupid. How many of you have ever argued over which directions to take to go somewhere? <laughs> and don't expect him to stop and ask for directions because he won't. That's not a male trait. They cannot ask for directions. My goodness, somebody might think they don't know what they're doing, and that would be tragic. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> More wisdom could save a marriage. Peace is so wonderful. Verse 15, this superficial wisdom is not such as comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, animal, even devilish, and demoniacal. For wherever, now I want you to listen to this because this is good for your homes. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention, which is strife, rivalry and selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. Can I just say, mom and dad, if you're going to have a home full of strife, you can expect your kids to be rebellious. Thank you for that little bit of agreement. But the wisdom from above. You know, there's earthly wisdom. There's people that think they're wise and that they know so much, but we live by a different kind of wisdom. Here's an example. I had a man helping me with my taxes one time that told me I was giving too much money to the church. Well, see, he didn't, he didn't, know, he didn't have the wisdom I had. Matter of fact, he told me, it's not wise. <laughs> and I thought, well, you just don't get it. It's the wisest thing that I do. And there's so many things like that. If we're going to have true wisdom, the God kind of wisdom, see, it doesn't make any sense to the natural mind to forgive your enemies. It doesn't make any sense to the natural mind to not try to defend yourself when somebody falsely accuses you. But we have another example. His name is Jesus. And we get to not only believe in him, but to follow his example and have the best life that we can possibly have. Jesus said, and it's recorded in John 14, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give unto you, my own special peace I now give and bequeath unto you. So stop allowing yourselves to be upset and disturbed. How many of you would be willing to zip your lip if it meant that you could save a day of upset? You got your hands up, we'll see the next time somebody says something, what happens? <laughs> 